Welcome to the Maddie Rocks Experience and on the road with Maddie Rocks on location in NAM 2015 in Anaheim, California, day number three. Joined with special guest, good friend and bass player of Whitesnake, Michael Devon. Hello there, Maddie. Hello, all. Good to catch up with you again. It's been a while. It's been a minute, man. We finally got this done. So, <laughs> yeah, man. Years. We had to jump through a few rings of fire. <laughs> Apparently to do this. We were supposed to do it on the road somewhere. Kadat, Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin. But uh, the backstage was, was pretty egregious. It was pretty unbearable. I don't know how. It was just we were not connecting on that one. So, yeah, it's good to be here, man. Here we are. Uh, Michael, how's your, uh, how's your NAM going for you? Great. You know, um, today's actually the first day I've been able to get down to the convention because I've had uh, three three concerts over at the observatory which is about tw 20 minutes away and um you know that's pretty much been taking up most of my time i was uh, the, the bonzo bash was the first night last night was uh randy Rhodes remembered and uh tonight will be um a celebration of uh the who's uh john and twistle and keith moon so uh, the ox and loon show so yeah that's uh that's been my nam weekend today i had a signing over at ebs uh, the pedal company, and uh, and that was cool, but uh, yeah, it's good to be here. It's good to see people. You know, you come here and you see all your friends, everybody you haven't seen for a year. You know, right yeah. Michael, if you would take us back uh, to 2014 and give us some of the highlights that took place with you before we closed out the year. Of this year, 2014. Oh wow. Well, we did. Um, gosh. I did a lot in 2014. Now that I think about it, I've been working on um, solo material. Uh, which will be coming out soon in the spring, uh, just a little little EP, and um, did some dates, did some stuff with Doug Aldrich, Brian Tishy, did uh, s some steamroller dates, which is always fun, you know, it's always a blast. And uh, then uh, White Snake uh, reconvened to uh, work on the new album, uh, record, and uh, do all the things that. Uh, uh, you know, is required to promote a new album. Videos, photo shoots, that whole thing. So we all got together. We have a new band member this year, so that's been a big change for us. Uh, you know, uh, Doug is, uh, Doug's my bro, you know, and, uh, you know, it's always sad to say goodbye, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, we're still friends. We still talk all the time. Um, I haven't yet experienced the road without... Uh, without some of my, my brothers, but it'll be cool. Joel's a great guy, Joel Hoekstra. He's a new, new guitar player, and he's, he's really great and a uh, fun guy. You know, we got to hang out while we were making the record and the videos and the, and the, and the press photos and stuff like that. So, and I actually just saw him last night. He played uh, in the Randy Rhodes Remembered show. So um, I don't know. I, I have, yeah, I have really good vibes about, uh, about this year with uh, White Snake. Deal. Very productive. Uh, Michael, if you would, take us back to the early years of your life in New England and uh, give us some insight to how music and bass playing came into your life. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I'll tell you uh, where I come from. Um, there's not a whole hell of a lot to do outside of uh, play football or get in trouble. So the, the, the middle ground, I suppose, was uh, for me was, was music. I've always been a creative person uh, as a young person child I drew a lot I've always kind of had an imagination that needed to uh, be expressed so um, I found it in rock and roll at some at some point around around 11 I suppose it was about that age and I um, started getting uh, into the guitar around uh, maybe 12 or 13 somewhere in there I got my hands on a bass and um, I don't know I don't know why the bass it's just something about it just spoke to me and um, you know, I've been kind of exploring it ever since. But, you know, in Massachusetts, I mean, it's pretty much the, the radio there is, is hard rock. You know, that's what we're all kind of um, born and bred on. Um, it's not really, uh, it's, it's not very eclectic, you know. It's, it's still that way. So I heard a lot of hard rock growing up and, you know, went to a lot of concerts. And, um, you know, it was the woods, man. We grew up in the sticks. We grew up kind of in the woods. So it was, it was keg parties in the woods and bonfires and... And, uh, and, you know, radios, you know what I mean? So, uh, it's never died for me, you know what I mean? I still feel like that same kid, you know? I always will. I'll always have that uh, connection to it, that youthful kind of exuberance when it comes to rock music. Because it's awesome. 
Who were some of the musical influences early on in your life who have helped shape and make you the great bass player that you are today? Oh, wow. Well, I would say, uh, I would say John Paul Jones uh, was, you know, probably the top of that list. Um, and Geezer Butler um, from Black Sabbath. And uh, John Entwistle from The Who. Um, Getty Lee from Rush. Steve Harris uh, of Iron Maiden. Um, I liked it. Uh, Chris Squire of Yes. Uh, I liked all of the loud and proud basses. But I also really enjoyed people like uh, um, Cliff Williams from ACDC and Sting, the police. I really liked, you know, the guys who could really just hold it down. And, and uh, Paul McCartney, you know, he's, he's a genius, a musical genius, a bassist, you know. So those were the guys that were, were really uh, informing me on how to play bass. What musical projects early on in your life uh, were you a part of that would help prepare you for where you are today as a musician? Oh, early on. Well, you know, I mean, basically the thing to do it, it uh, you know, in Massachusetts was to basically just kind of join, join a band and go play some backyards. You know what I mean? It was like all about backyard parties. So we, uh, we did a lot of that, you know. Dean Del Rey right here, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Yes. My good friend Dean Del Rey here. Um, yeah, we did a lot of uh, a lot of backyard parties, you know, and uh, that's where I sort of learned how to play. See you in a minute, brother. Um, because there weren't many venues uh, that would, uh, I think there was only one in town that would allow, you know, underage kids to kind of go play. So I did a lot of that, man. Uh, snuck into a lot of places, said I was older than I was, but I wasn't, you know. Joined a band, um, I was uh, 14 and they were thir like 28, <laughs> you know, like 30. They were older cats. I learned a lot though. I learned a lot from that first band. So, yeah. And it's just been kind of going ever since. The journey to Whitesnake, how did it come to be for you? Oh, the journey to Whitesnake. Um, it came through uh, my, my good friend, Brian Tishy. As lots of uh, musical uh, opportunities have come, because he's, uh, you know, he's my good luck charm. I'd like to say the same about me to him, but he, uh, we were playing in George Lynch's band at the time, in the Lynch Mob with, with Oni and um, Oni Logan. And um, I had uh, recently um, procured the, the bass position of uh, Jason Bonham's Led Zeppelin experience. So we were out with George, and I was working on uh, making sure my, my uh, Zeppelin chops were up to snuff. And while all that was going on, Brian got the call to go play in Whitesnake. And uh, I didn't really think anything of it, but until um, he said that David wanted, to, uh, wanted me to compile a video, uh, some video footage, um, so he could watch me play live. And... Uh, I still didn't think anything of it. I was like, I, you know, so I, but I did send it off. And uh, long story short, you know, um, I went up and met the man in uh, Tahoe uh, on a on a gig day. Uh, uh, Lynch Mob were playing uh, in uh, Reno, uh, so I went up there and we met and we had a great talk, great time. He was a, he was a lovely man. He is a lovely man, and uh, you know, I love the guy. I really do. I think he's. Uh, <laughs> I think he's a funny guy, and he's fun, and he's a hard-working man, and he knows his shit, you know? He knows his music, so I dig that about David, you know? He reaches for the stars all the time, you know? And we just kind of hit it off, and, and here we are. What, like, I don't know, five years later? Yeah. So when that press release, August 10th, 2010, broke, it was yeah. about to get real, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was the real deal, yeah. I, I remember being in Seattle on a day off, and I was uh, with the lynch mob, and, and I was walking to the mall to meet Tishy for some lunch or something, and uh, he called me, David called me. Hello, Michael. And I said, hey, and he said, how would you like to be in White Snake?" And I went, holy shit. I'm like, are you serious, man? Yes, yeah, yeah, you bet. So um, it, was pretty, it was a pretty cool day, because, you know, that day I had three jobs, you know, I was in Lynch Mob, and I was going to go off and do Jason, Bonham's Led Zeppelin Experience, and then after that, I'd go off to make the record with uh, David and the boys uh, in Whitesnake. I was a, it was a very, a very happy day. 
you follow many great bass players who have uh, been in the band before, like Marco Mendoza and yeah. Uriah Duffy. Yeah. Um, how did that make you feel to follow along in their footsteps? And let's not forget Neil Murray. Neil's a great bassist, man. Um, great, man. Those are big shoes, you know what I'm saying? Those are really big shoes to fill. Um, Marco's awesome, you know, man. He's just a badass bass player. Uh, and so is Uriah. You know, versatile, man. Your eye is great, dude. He fucking accompanies himself all day long, you know. Um, great guys, you know. Um, I cannot do what they do on bass. What I do is something a little different, but yeah. But uh, and You all have your own individual twist, so that's what's... Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, man. What is one thing that uh, David Coverdale has taught or influenced you along the way? To, um, to not be so shy. You know, to uh, stand tall, stand proud, um, you know, show, show your goods, you know what I mean? Um, if you can do it, then do it, and uh, be proud that you can do it, and, and uh, don't, listen to, don't listen to people, don't listen to the naysayers, you know what I mean? He, he taught me that, because I had, I had a bit of a shyness, especially vocally, singing-wise, I, you know, I had a, a hang-up on it until, uh, until he came into my life, and then when he came into my life... He changed me. He kind of like flipped the switch inside of me. He really did. He said, hey, you can, you can sing. Go sing, you know. Yeah. I'll always love him for that and appreciate him for that. So you're part of the uh, first uh, release that you've been a part of, Forevermore. How proud are you were of that project were you when it finally released? Oh, I was extremely proud of it, you know. Um, just the fact that I got to be um, on the album and, uh, you know, of original material uh, from a, such a, a stellar... Sterling band as White Snake, you know, um, and I got to be on it with, uh, you know, my my best bud, you know, me and Brian were, have been playing together for years, and it was it's cool, you know, it's cool that that's sort of a moment in time for the for the both of us. It's personal to me, you know, and then my relationship with uh, Doug, the, how that blossomed over the years. Uh, it's a great album. I, I'll always be fond of that of that time. Out of the White Snake catalog, yeah. what is the favorite song that you love to play live? You mean out of the entire... Out of the entire catalog. Oh, wow. That's a good question. I mean, I would say... I love, I love Fool for Your Lovin'. I love the bass line on that. And I love... Um, um, I love uh, Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City. I like the bass line on that, too. Um, those are probably... Those are probably my top... My top two. Um, yeah. I'd say those... I like, I like Forevermore, too. It's a good song. It's a good heavy tune. Yeah. When you're not doing White Snake or all these other projects that you're involved with, yeah. what could we find you listening to or 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 delving into oh. music wise? Oh wow. Still the bluegrass? <laughs> not so much the bluegrass. Um, but uh, I listen to I listen to a lot of uh, I would say soul and blues, blues and soul. Um, I tend not to listen to hard rock too often. It's strange. Although I go through my phases where I want to listen to Black Sabbath a lot. Um, but I do. I listen to a lot of uh, Otis Redding, Sam Cooke, uh, stuff like that. And I'm always sort of investigating new bands as well. Um, you know, I'm always kind of listening to what people are doing, you know. Um, I like the new Rival Sons album. I thought that was a really, that's a really good um, Really good album. So this, this young band, uh, I think they're called Temples. They have a cool album out. Um, yeah, ACDC's new album is great, Rock or Bust. I think that sounds great. And I think Brian Johnson sounds better on that than he has in fucking years, man. Yeah. Yeah. You are part of the EBS family, where we just came from, their booth. How does it, how does it feel to be a part of that family of, of pedals? Oh, they're great, man. And, and they're just really, really good people over there. They take really good care of their artists. And, uh, you know, anything I can ever do to help them, I, I will, because they've, they've been taking really good care of me. Yeah. Throughout your professional career so far, have you had that defining moment? No. I want, I want it, though. I want it. I'm still waiting for it. But I, I've had glimpses, you know, for sure. You know, walking out, uh, let's say, onto the stage of Sweden Rock or uh, Monsters of Rock or, you know, those, those kinds of moments. Maybe a, a downpour in South America, you know, with tens of thousands of fans. That's, that's something. Those are, those are pretty defining moments, you know, I would say. 
Um, but yeah, I... Yet to come. Yet to come. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Biggest accomplishment to date musically for you? Oh, my biggest accomplishment to date musically. Um, oh, boy. Well, I would say uh, so far it's probably been trying to get the um, solo material together to get that out in the world. And uh, I suppose when I do get out in the world, that would be the answer to that question is getting some solo material out into the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything that you would like to add to this interview that maybe we have not touched on? Yes, I would love it. Um, tonight, is, as I said, is the Ox and Loon. And last night was Randy Rhodes Remembered. We actually made an album. Um, called uh, uh, Randy Rhodes Remembered uh, Volume 1. Brian Tishy has put it out. Um, and it's, a, it's all a bunch of players, great guitar players who've all come in. Uh, Phil Demo, uh, Phil X, Rowan Robinson, uh, Brent Woods. Um, oh, God. Uh, Mike Orlando, uh, uh, Mitch Perry. The list goes on and on and on. I'm sure I'm forgetting a bunch. Uh, Sebastian Bach sang on it. I sang on it. Uh, I played bass on it as well. Rudy Sarzo played bass on it. Uh, Phil Suzanne played bass on it. Brian Tishy played drums on it. Uh, Jeff Scott Soto sang on it as well. Um, uh, there are other cats who sang on it too. Um, I'm sorry I'm blanking. Uh, Chaz West sang on it. Um, and it's a great record. And uh, if you can go out there and find it and get it, buy it. It's, uh, it's, in, uh, it's a tribute to Randy Rhodes. And it sounds really great. Uh, so that's out there. And uh, White Snake's got a new album coming out uh, this year, 2015. It's going to be an exceptional record. I'm very, very proud of the record myself personally, uh, and I'm, I think all the boys are. And uh, it's going to it's going to kick ass. It's a great album, and we're going to see you out on the road this year uh, for uh, some uh, some touring, some big big rock shows. Right on. We look forward to that release and the touring. Yeah. What does the future hold for Michael Devon? More music, more life, more love. More family. Yeah, more friends. Where can fans keep up with everything going on with you and including all the other projects you're working on? Thanks, Maddie. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for taking the time, man. Where can they keep up with you? Oh, I thought you said you, meaning where, like yeah. W-E hyphen where. Like, we're going to keep up with you. Oh, thanks. And, and I will, too. Thanks. But where can they keep up with everything you're got, you've got going uh, on with you yourself? Know, you, through your, through your, like, your average social media things, your Facebooks and your... And your uh, Twitters and your Instagrams and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't actually have a, a real uh, website. I should probably do that. <laughs> I'm going to give you the opportunity to send a message to Maddie Rock's listeners all around the United States and around the world who are going to potentially hear and see this interview. Okay. What would you like to say to them? I would like to say peace and love and prosperity in the year 2015. And don't forget about your rock and roll. Take a dose every day. Daily dose of rock and roll. Good message. Michael, thank you very much thank for you, taking the time out of your busy NAM schedule to sit with me finally to get this done. Yeah. It's been a while, and uh, continued success to you and everything you've got going on musically you, in your life. Appreciate it. And you've heard it here, Matty Rocks listeners, on the road with Matty Rocks and Michael Devon of Whitesnake. Peace. Thanks again, Michael. You got it, my friend. Thank you. Matty Rocks out. <laughs>